on this night where we remember the Passover of our Lord, the Last Supper, the institution of the Eucharist, we hear from John's Gospel. The Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 17, we hear so much about what Jesus wanted to make sure his disciples understood. He wanted to give them everything, every last thing that he could before departing in the garden, from the garden, de- departing, being arrested in the garden, before laying down his life on the cross. He wanted them to get every last thing that he could. And for this reason, he, we hear it said, he loved his own in the world, and he loved them to the end. He knew his hour had come, and yet he spent time over a meal with them. And of course, it's not just any meal. It's the institution of the Eucharist. And, and to understand what is happening at the Eucharist, at the Last Supper, we have to know the roots of it. We have to understand, really, the Jewish roots of the Passover. So I've been reading, some of you have read Dr. Brant, Brant Petrie's book, the, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. Um, and it explains what maybe some of you already know much about, and and yet, there's so much more that maybe you don't know. I think the first thing to point out to understand what Jesus is doing is to understand that the Last Supper is a Passover meal. Okay, that's the feast that is being celebrated. It's the feast of the Passover. So of all the times that Jesus could offer his life, lay down his life, where he died on the cross for our sins, of all the times he could have chosen, he chose the Passover. And... Um, why did we do that? Well, again, we have to go back to the original Passover. So in the original situation, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, have been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. The Pharaoh has them in, in living in horrible conditions, working as slaves. And God delivers them from slavery to Pharaoh and to Egypt They go out, they make an exodus, they make an exit, they go through the wilderness, and then they enter the promised land. Okay, Israel. Now we know the story, at least, you know, at least the broad strokes. But there's five aspects of the Passover that I want to talk about first. In order to celebrate this Passover, which was perpetually celebrated and still is, okay, the Jewish people still celebrate it and and so do we. That's what we do at every Mass, as you'll, as you'll see. But first, to celebrate the Passover, an unblemished lamb was chosen. This is what God commanded the Israelites to do, as you heard in the first reading. Okay, An unblemished male lamb was chosen. The second thing is the lamb was sacrificed. And then the blood of the lamb was spread over the doorposts of the homes where the Jewish people lived. All right? That's the part that gets a lot of attention, because... As you heard in the first reading, the angel of death passes over the homes where the blood of the lamb has been spread. No death happens there. Any other home, the firstborn is is dead. The firstborn of everything. And that is what sets Israel free from Egypt. So they're delivered by the blood of the lamb. They're protected by the blood of the lamb and set free from slavery because of the blood of the Lamb. Okay, The fourth thing, though, that doesn't get as much attention is that they were then supposed to eat the Lamb. They were supposed to eat the Lamb. There were, you heard, again, in the first reading, you heard all this. How are you supposed to eat this? As people in flight, you're ready to go. There were instructions about how to do it. And if anything was left over, it was supposed to be... um, they're like, there wasn't supposed to be anything left over. Okay, so what, and the, oh, and, and then the fifth thing. So those are the four things, but the fifth thing is that they were to keep the Passover as a day of remembrance. The Passover is not simply a one-time feast. It was designated as a memorial day and an annual celebration that was to be kept by Israel forever. Exodus 12, 14 says this. 
This day shall be for you a day of remembrance, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as an ordinance forever. Which they have done and which we are doing. This, these five steps point to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Why is it an unblemished male lamb? What's, why is it unblemished? Well, if Jesus is the Lamb of God, he's unblemished because he has no sins. He's sinless. The Lamb was sacrificed. And the blood of the Lamb is not over the doorpost of a home, but over us, our souls, and if you will, over the doorposts of our souls, as in on our lips. And no death will come upon the one whose soul has been covered by the blood of the lamb. They were to eat the lamb. There's a kind of communion with the lamb, with this lamb who was the victim for them. They consume the lamb. Well, what's the communion? Well, we consume the body and blood of Christ, the Passover lamb. And, number five, they were to keep this as a remembrance forever. What did Jesus say just in this, in this, um, you know, in in this gospel we heard a little bit about um, being set free from, uh, being washed clean. But we also know that Jesus said, at the Last Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say, Tonight on Holy Thursday, we're doing something special. We're never going to do this again. It's a one-time event. No, he said, this is my body which will be given for you. Take this, eat of it. It's my body. It's going to be given for you. Take this, drink of it. This is the new covenant in my blood. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. Just as the Passover was kept every year, that feast was kept every year. So the Passover of the Lord is to be kept regularly. Now, there's actually more that Dr. Petrie drew out from the celebration of the Passover. In the time of Jesus, there were certain expectations that they had. So in the time of Christ, the Jewish practice of the Passover had this sense that they were being brought back to that Passover night, like the original night from 1,500 years ago that they were there. That sense that they were there is... It captured in, here's a quote from rabbinic teaching that captures this a little bit. Quote, In every generation, a man must regard himself as if he came forth out of Egypt, as if he came forth himself out of Egypt. For it is written, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Therefore, we are bound to give thanks. So when your ancestors were set free from slavery to Pharaoh and to Egypt, so were you. Consider yourself as having been there. And every time we celebrate the Passover, it's as if we're there. In a, not a historical way, but in a, like a ritual way, we're there. That's what, that was the mentality at the time of Jesus. There was also, of course, the blessings that they would pray over the bread and over the wine. The Father would take the bread and say, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings, who creates the fruit of the vine. And also, the the food would be spoken about. Like, what does it mean that we're eating this? And what does it mean that we're eating that? The food was spoken about. The bitter herbs were eaten because of the years of bitter slavery in Egypt. The unleavened bread was eaten because we were to eat as though we were in flight. We didn't have time for the you know, bread to rise. There's, there's a speaking element to explain why are we eating this food. And so when Jesus speaks over the bread, this is my body. This is a, he doesn't talk about, we don't hear anything about him saying anything about the lamb or or the, the, the traditional Passover things. He's talking about, he's celebrating a Passover meal, not talking about the past. He's celebrating a Passover meal, talking about what's going to happen tomorrow on Good Friday when he's going to lay down his life. He's celebrating, he's he's saying, this is my body which will be given for you. What gets sacrificed on Passover? The Passover lamb. Jesus is saying, I am 
the true Passover lamb. And I am setting you free from slavery. I, not from Pharaoh or Egypt, but from slavery to sin and death and Satan. Pharaoh is basically kind of a symbol of the evil one, typologically, not literally, but and Egypt and slavery and all of that is symbols of sin and bondage and, and death. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to set you free. We're not leaving Egypt. Jesus is celebrating the Passover in the Holy, in the Promised Land. He's in Jerusalem celebrating the Passover meal. So if there's this new exodus, where are they departing? From where are they departing? And where's the Promised Land to which they are going? Well, departing, again, sin and death and going to heaven, the true Promised Land. That's the exodus that Jesus is bringing about at the Last Supper, as he points to Good Friday, and as he says, this is the true Passover, so that you would understand, so that we would all understand what Jesus is doing. There was an original slavery to Pharaoh Egypt, and there was an original Passover lamb. All of that, and all of those years, and all of the prophets as well, are, are setting us up to understand who Jesus is, so that we will understand what the cross means, what the resurrection means, what we're being set free from, and where we're going. And of course, who is, the, who is the one who gets us there? In later tradition, the Passover was believed to be the time when the Messiah would come. They had this tradition that at the same night as Passover would be the night that the Messiah would redeem Israel. This was an expectation at the time of Jesus. Jesus chose to fulfill these expectations that the Jewish people had of his time. And he did this in order for us that we might understand, again, what is the Mass all about? Like when we celebrate Mass, when he said, do this in remembrance of me, what is it that is happening? Well, what is happening is the one sacrifice offered once for all is made present in a sacramental way once again. And we still, that, that one sacrifice offered once for all still has power. It still breaks chains, still sets us free from slavery to sin and to death, still makes us new creations. That that power is still present because Jesus is alive. Jesus, the Passover lamb, has commanded us to do this. And also St. Paul commands us in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed Therefore, let us keep the feast. And what's the feast that he's talking about? Keep the feast. Which feast? We've got a lot of feasts. The feast is the Eucharist. The Eucharist, the celebration of the Mass. And so Jesus sets us free from slavery to sin and death, from our own fleshly desires to the evil one, to the world, leads us out of that and to the true promised land, to heaven. Each one of us are on this Exodus journey, and we are together on this Exodus journey as well to the heavenly promised land. The sacrifice that Christ offered once for all on the cross remains ever powerful. As often as the sacrifice of the cross, this is from the Catechism, as often as the sacrifice of the cross by which Christ our Pasch has been sacrificed is celebrated on the altar the work of our redemption is carried out. Jesus is still present in our midst to set people free from sin, He's still present in our midst to give us hope, still present in our midst to offer his life-giving power and his resurrection power to transform our hearts and our lives. And that's why we celebrate the Mass. And that's what, how Jesus offers himself to us. And when he sets us free, it gives us his his power is released in our lives. And, and that's the power to obey the Lord. Like freedom from sin, but the, the freedom to obey the Lord. The freedom from selfishness to be slaves to ourself, but the freedom to love one another. And the power and the strength to love one another with the strength that comes from God to love one another. And to serve 
God first. That's the freedom, that's the joy that he has for us. And of course, when he washes the disciples' feet, he is allowing them to understand, I want you to know, he's saying, I want you to know that the greatest must be the servant, and I want you to love each other as I've loved you, which we see ultimately on the cross, but we see also as he washes their feet, as he serves them, as he, as he spends, I mean, just this, um, this, I I'm always marvel at the amount of time he spends with them right before he knows he's going to lay down his life. Because I just can't imagine how hard it would be to be focused on someone else when you know you're going to die tomorrow. I would just be isolating myself in my room. I would, if someone had a question for me, I'd be like, don't talk to me right now. I've got bigger problems than you. Okay? But Jesus' love And when we're receiving him in the Eucharist, we have the power to love as he loves. And he knows he's going to lay down his life. And he's got all these questions. I mean, just think about, Master, which one of us is going to betray you? Like, Peter, John, Judas, different people ask him this at, at, at dinner. He has patience for all of the questions. I'm sure there were many more. We don't know what they all were. But sometimes we look at the apostles asking Jesus questions, they seem like little children asking something of their dad. and Because there's so much they just don't get yet. And Jesus, with loving care and concern and patience for all of that, addresses them like he has all the time in the world. I want to love like that. And I know that the place to receive the grace to do that is the Eucharist, where we get, where the power of God, we get, we get, the one who is love itself, we, are, we commune with him, the Passover lamb. We become one flesh with him. It's his grace, his life in us, that allows us to then, in loving service, put others first, to wash the feet of each other, to say, I am here to serve, and I am here to give. He also teaches us that the higher you know, the more authority or the more responsibility you have, think especially in your families, but the more responsibility you have, the more of a concern you need to take for, for the little ones in your care or for everyone in your care to be attentive to them and to what they need. Jesus sets us this example, and then he gives us the grace to follow it. 